Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. You're going to enjoy today's interview. It's with James Allen and Michael Close, two magicians, two skeptics, two rationalists that I interviewed on stage live at a show in Toronto at the Cage for the Center for Inquiry. We had about 45 people on uh, with us in the room, and we had a live interview, Q&A, interaction. It was fantastic. We talked about magic and wonder in the 21st century. I think you're going to really enjoy it. Check it out here today. Don't forget to sign up for my digital newsletter comes out twice a month on mindmarket.com you can read some of my blogging at taking it global check what out what else i do at davidpecklive.com and don't forget to pick up uh, you know my best selling book at least one day uh, called real change is incremental i think you'll enjoy it we'll talk soon thank you james so how about before we start, how about a nice, uh, generous round of applause for Michael Close, Dr. James I could tell that most of you probably already know these guys, so we're not going to waste any time on uh, idle chit-chat or pleasantries. We're going to get right into it. So we're, we're here today to talk about... A few things, and as James said, this is uh, Face to Face. It's a podcast that I've been doing for about a year and a half. Uh, This is about my 85th interview. Um, We uh, go to rabble.ca. You can find it on my website, davidpecklive.com. And the uh, uh, listenership is growing. So it's kind of fun. It's kind of interesting. We interview magicians, philosophers, um, uh, interviewed a poet, uh, interviewed a cook, interviewed a photographer. We ended up spending more time about philosophy and assumptions and worldview than we actually did about cooking and photography. So pretty wonderful. So I've uh, handed out some pads. There's a couple pens up here. If you think you have a question, I know you do. Uh, It's kind of what you guys are into. So if you've got something on your mind, put it down on a piece of paper. I'll repeat the question up here, toss it up onto the stage, and we're going to have hopefully have a little bit of fun, but also dig a little deeper. We're talking about, correct me if I'm wrong, James, um, Dr. James Allen, tell me. if I'm wrong here, but we're talking about magic basically in the 21st century. How can magic even exist in the 21st century? I mean, it, isn't it a kind of a, isn't it kind of oxymoronic in a way? Are we, almost are we tipping our hat, Michael, in a way when we, we come out here, to, especially to a group of skeptics? Uh, we'll get into whether or not you're radical skeptics a little later on. <laughs> but how does magic exist in a culture right. like today? Well, Michael. I believe the performances tonight proved it's dead. <laughs> that it no longer has any relevance to anyone's lives. And these all, all those in favor poor, of that, please. No, 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 no. Well, there is something about human beings who find the mysterious intriguing. The fact that as a species, we encounter something we can't explain and with whatever technology is available, we try to find an answer for that, is the reason that we're doing this interview in this very nice room in front of these nice people and not in a cave picking the fleas off each other. So when faced with something that cannot immediately be explained, the species looks for answers. So, I mean, Descartes, Bacon, all the greats, all the philosophers basically said that. I've, magic I've had Bacon, I haven't had Descartes. Fran- Francis, yes. Oh, Francis, that guy, uh, yes. Rene, Francis. All philosophy begins in wonder. It seems to me magic kind of is well situated, it seems, depending on the magician that you're watching, of course, but it's kind of situated in that world of, of wonder of a sort. And yet we're sitting in a room, you know, Center for Inquiry. You guys aren't interested really in wonder, right? It's about the, It's about the reason. It's about the answer. It's about the rational side, not the mysterious. Yeah. Is, is that fair? 
I think so. I mean, I enjoy magic as a safe way of celebrating not knowing. So there are all so kinds. So you're okay with uncertainty. I, I, I love uncertainty, but there are all kinds of people, and you can name more of them probably than I can in this audience, who would take something which does not have an explanation at your fingertips and would then use that as a wedge or a lever to try and sell you a pill, a, a, a concoction, a lifestyle, a religion, and they would use the unknown to try and get something out of you, to try and take advantage of you. And I think it's nice to come up here as magicians and say, you know, you are not going to be able to explain most of this, and that's okay. It's but, o James, is it okay though? And Michael, this question's for you too, and everyone in the room, frankly. So I, I do magic as well, um, not maybe as good as these two fine uh, young gentlemen here, but I did a, a show for my uh, uh, daughter's birthday party a couple of weeks ago, seven years old. The classic, right? You tell somebody you do magic, and you're immediately assumed to be a, a clown or a balloon sculpturist. Um, not necessarily. That's on my business That's card. That's right. Not, <laughs> not, not a fine young magician. And I started the performance, and within seconds of, of, of the first, the second effect, I had a couple of kids in the audience. They're eight. They're seven. They're eight. I mean, is this too many video games? And they immediately wanted to either know the answer, and maybe you guys take a lot of pleasure in this, they immediately wanted to know the answer and started to bark out, oh, it's, you know, it's the classic, it's up your sleeve, it's, I know this one, my uncle did this. I mean, all the classics I got, now maybe you're just gonna say, I'm a shitty magician, but <laughs> I think there's something I going think on there. I that's on your business card. Isn't that's it? right, yes. <laughs> no. On the uh, marquee no. out front, yeah. actually. Uh, I think Why anybody, the any, desire to know at well, six? It, because that's in our DNA. I believe, I believe when confronted with something that you do not immediately understand the answer to, human beings, and I've, I've talked to magicians about this, I've said to magicians that you have to define what it is you're doing. Every other art form defines what they're doing. Most magicians don't take the time to define what they're doing. My definition is, is that magic is a theatrical event, with the theatrical being important, and theater being this room, or a table in a restaurant, or a big stage in Las Vegas, or all of us sitting around at a picnic table someplace, that is my venue, that is my theater. So it's a theatrical event in which something happens that has no logical explanation and no rationalized explanation satisfies you. Because those are the two ways that human beings deal with that experience. Magician does something. What's the first thing you do? Logically, can I figure it out rationally? No, I can't. So what do I do? I try to rationalize it away. Well, what are the rationalization? It's up its, up its sleeve. It's a trap door. It was whatever those things are. That Doesn't that people... bother you, though, no. that a kid wants to know, instead of saying, oh, man, Michael, that is the best magic trick I've ever seen. That's incredible. You took me to another place. Well, no, you know, a, a child, I fell in love for the seventh time after watching that card Well, I, I don't expect that from a seven-year-old, and I believe that's illegal in most provinces in, uh, in Canada. So, no, with, with children, there's a different experience. I don't perform for children, so I don't have any useful information to add into that. But my audience is the kind of audience that I work for tonight. I want to work for the most intelligent person I can possibly work for. And I design the material that I perform to deceive the most intelligent people because the experience of being really fooled and walking away from a show going, I don't think a human being can do this, makes your heart and your head in conflict because your head says, that can't be real. And your heart says, that's one of the most real things I've ever experienced. Now, that's not, an, that's not a wrong thing. I'm not claiming supernatural powers. I just want you to feel that thing. And to be able to say, I have no idea, yeah, yeah. and be happy with who that. Is, who, and you would know this. Who's the magician um, that said after a performance, after a, an effect, isn't it wonderful? Um, uh, probably be Keller. 
So a famous magician of 100 or so years ago would do an effect or one in particular and, and sort of proclaim to the audience, isn't it wonderful? That, that's kind of what drew me to philosophy. That's kind of what drew me to magic in the first place, you know, watching somebody take a coin, vanish it, and, and actually sitting with the moment, or at least trying to sit with the moment. And I don't think that happens anymore. Because I think, you know, let, I let don't know, did it happen to you guys? Let me read this, let me read this. So, so it happened. Let me read now, this, the, let the me read thing, this. So T. Nelson Down said in 1908. Oh, he was a hack. Why are you quoting that? <laughs> as, as, quote, as to the future of magic, we shall not venture a prediction. Our good friend Dr. Wilson looks forward to the day when electricity shall become the nimble assistant and obedient servant of the worker of wonders. When the mysterious fluid will relegate strings, threads, pistons, and such adventious, adventious aids to the limbo of the obsolete, when it will open and close doors and cabinets, the lids of boxes, the traps and tables, and when by means of the counteracting forces of the positive and negative electromagnet, a body will be suspended in space. In other words, Downs, a famous magician, is saying one day magic's not gonna mean anything because technology is gonna take us to a place where wonder and mystery don't exist anymore. Is that where we're at today? In the no. 21st century? Or no. are we, have we got a no. long way to go before well, that? Well, famous magician, disparaging about where they were headed yes, because but of let's technology. Put, put that famous magician in context historically. You don't know who T. Nelson Downs was. T. Nelson Downs lived around the beginning of the 20th century. So he reached his heyday in the 1900s and, and that. So yes, the invention of things, not the invention, but the utilization of things like magnetism and electricity and all these things, certainly they, you have to remember that Robert Houdin in the late 1800s, at least according to legend, won over the uh, Algerian chiefs or whatever it was with electromagnetism because he had a chest on his stage, a small little box that he could lift, but the strongest of the tribesmen couldn't lift it because they didn't realize that electromagnetism was in effect and they couldn't lift that up. So, but in a magic show, we sometimes use the simplest of techniques. I mean, what you want to do is see something and go, there's no technology that I'm aware of that could possibly accomplish this. The need to be astonished by things is part of us. And it's completely beaten to death by current technology. What's the first thing that comes up? If you buy a DVD, I'm going to do it. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. What's the first thing I'm going to look at? I want to see how they made it. I want to see how all the special effects works. I want to ruin that moment for myself. <laughs> because when you're watching a movie, you're saying to yourself, how did they do that? How did they do that? How did they do that? But what's the best special effects? That's the one where you didn't even realize the special effect was happening. They're using CGI and crowds and what have you, and you have no idea that's even going on. I had no idea that that facial expression was taken from some other take and superimposed on this. There's technology, and then there's the intelligent use of technology. But human beings need to, exp and magicians especially, because I, I tell magicians when I lecture for them, it's like being in a dentist. A dentist has to sit in that chair every now and then. Dentist has to know what you're going through. Because he's the guy doing it to somebody else, and you got to know what it feels like. And if I do it and perform it, and I hope when I perform it, I'm not coming off as a jerk. I'm more coming off as we'll experience this together. And just like Keller, isn't it wonderful? Well, yes, it is. It's fabulous. There's nothing like it on the planet. Unfortunately, most people never get to see a magic so show my, that does that. My my mother-in-law, I was uh, practicing. Oh, her again? I, know. I, I was practicing. I was there a few years ago, and uh, I was working on a, a coin effect. And I okay. was playing as magicians will do with coins and cards from time to time. And I was walking through a ha hallway, and I tossed the coin, presumably from one hand to the other. And as I came around the corner and vanished the coin, my mother-in-law caught the sight of it. She said, God, I hate magic. What's going on there? What is it about that skepticism that clearly you in this room here from the Center for Inquiry at CFICanada.ca, um, looking to boost their membership in 2015, by the way, um, would, would, would probably not fall into that category based on what I've seen here tonight. What's going on there, James? Well, the 
there is the instinctive reaction to something you don't recognize or don't understand, which is hostility, which is, again, I think, built into our DNA. It happened the first time we met, actually, James. <laughs> this is true. And it's um, all the work of our species for the past several thousand years has been trying to get past that. How can we find better ways of approaching problems? How can we find better ways of tackling problems? Um, and one of the ways that magic works is by taking advantage of false assumptions. So if you assume something to be true, you don't question it. Well, how can we then train ourselves to go back and actually question that? And it doesn't happen in the context of a magic show. You never get a chance to say, do that again. You never get a chance to go back and rewind and watch the video uh, unless you're watching magic on TV and then it's been probably been prepared differently. Um, but ooh, questions are coming in from the audience. This is a live audience, by the way. And, uh, won't be when they anyone, are live. Not when, it, yeah, not when anyone listens to this, of course. Digital reproduction. Simulation, of course. But go ahead. Um, but, and we we're talking about doing magic for children. And I was always extremely uncomfortable doing magic for children because they want to know how it's done. And I have a background. Before this, I was a martial arts instructor. I studied math at U of T. I spent years tutoring students in math. And every instinct inside of me says that I ought to be explaining to these children how these things go. It made me feel really, really bad that I was in a position where I had to stifle that curiosity to put it on hold. Um, and I mean, the way I work finally personally came to work around it is I don't really do children shows anymore. I do workshops for children. So it's now a mix of magic that I perform but also now there's tricks in there that they explain and they get to learn. So it's a balance of, well, you don't get to know absolutely all of it right now, but now it's a different relationship and I am helping you and I am helping you see the world in a different way. And when you're saying, how did you do that? I'm not saying to you, well, very well, thank you. So are you saying you were uncomfortable with the idea of deceiving kids? Oh, I have no problem deceiving kids. Um, uh, that came out wrong. No, that came out right. No, but when... Oh, you're an honest, you're an honest liar, are you not? I, I, I'm, well, I'm honest to a fault, and people actually criticize me for it, but it made me feel bad when they said, how is that done? And I couldn't tell them. Uh, so, and so, it took me a very long time to find a workaround that was comfortable for me, personally, because uh, that bothered me. The, the problem with magic has always been that it hinges on the secret. And if the only thing that separates me from the audience is how it's done, then I'm not doing my job properly. That should be the least interesting thing about what we're doing. Because the secrets of magic are, for the most part, ridiculously simple. They are. They're ridiculously simple. But why you are fooled by ridiculously simple things is unbelievably complicated and interesting used, very interesting when i used to work at a restaurant in a in a bar called the houdini lounge in las vegas and it's in the monte Car it was in the monte carlo hotel where lance burton had his show and it was a great venue for me uh because there weren't time constraints on my performance i could do 10 minutes i could do a half an hour because it was a bar it wasn't a restaurant there wasn't a constraint and people would sometimes say to me how did you do that? And I would say to them, I will tell you if you tell me right now that you can devote two hours to that explanation. If you want to know, I'll sit down and tell you, but it will take two hours. Do you want to know? Sometimes they said yes, sometimes they said no. But the problem with magic is you believe because of however it's been passed down over the years, and because of the way magic is advertised, that the secret is simple. And the secret is not simple. If you were fooled by any of the things I did for you this evening, it's because there's so much more going on than you could possibly realize on first glance that's going on. And most people don't understand this. There's, there's a whole thing, there's this assumption, as James said, magic is based on assumption. But there's another kind of assumption. 
There's unconscious assumption. You bring your worldview to a performance without even knowing that you've brought your worldview to a performance. You think this is the way the world works. I take that belief without you even knowing you have this belief, and I make it false. And I can fool, and one of those unconscious beliefs is this. You think that there is a limit to the amount of trouble that a human being would go to just to fool somebody else. It's, it's pretty ridiculous. It, and it? Yeah. I will tell you, I am the living example of that is not true. I will go to any extent to fool you to death. And why do I want to fool you to death? Because you are intelligent people. You are really smart people. And I want, believe me, it is easy to fool stupid people. If you think that isn't true, turn your TV on. So I've got a, I got a question Watch. here. Good. Hmm. I've got a question here from somebody. Well, it's actually not a Maybe it is. Ginger or Marianne? <laughs> oh, wow. Marianne. Dave, is this question I was for you? pretty much a skipper guy most of my life. <laughs> skipper. Uh, I'm not sure where we're going with that existentially, but I'll, uh, I'll just file Michael, that you'll explain now. that to me when I'm older. Yeah, yeah, I'll file that one for now. So is it possible that, that, that we could talk about uh, magic as the art of fooling people? Yes, of course it is. Of yeah. course it is. I mean, one of the things that magicians talk about in the... And you have to understand, because you wouldn't know this. There is a huge... What's the right word, James? There's a huge... Not society, but a body of work of hobbyist magicians. Guys who probably never perform professionally, maybe they perform occasionally, for whom magic is very important. What was the question? Do you think that magic could be considered the art of fooling people? Yes. Is that is that a and, way to look at and it? And many of these guys in this group of people will say, I entertain them. I don't care about fooling them. My job is to entertain them, as if these are two separate things. And they are not. My job as a magician is to entertain you through the process of showing you things that cannot be logically explained and cannot be rationalized away. That's my job. Now, you can say, I don't want to fool them. I just want to entertain them. And I say, fine. Where it says magician on your business card, scratch that off. Scratch that off. Because I must fool you. That's my job. But I want to do it in such a way, and this is the hardest part, that the, and that's a horrible, you know, if it was fun to be fooled, that's how you get into magic, right? Mm -hmm. It's fun to be fooled. That's crap. That's absolute, if that was true, Richard Nixon would still be the president of the United <laughs> States. No kidding. Nobody likes to be fooled because it has the connotation of, I trusted you and you tricked me. So the question is, how do I do this hurtful thing? And we're all, we're all friends at the end of it. And that's, that's very difficult. And I've thought a lot about that. But it needs to be done because you need to, look, you need to be able to see something and go, I have no idea how that worked. And I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that because look around. How many things are going to go undiscovered in the lifetime of the people here in this room that we will never know exactly how it works. It's mysterious, it's beautiful, it's wonderful. I don't need to give it a supernatural explanation, but I can still rejoice in the astonishment of the fact that it works. I mean, like the fact that Adam Sandler gets movies made. <laughs> That's a different kind of astonishment. Exactly. James, you do a, you do a lot of work now working for prof uh, professional audiences, corporate crowds. You do a lot of close-up work mm -hmm. in, in tight. I've seen you do it many times. We were working in a, a conference recently, a lot of high school students, a pretty cynical bunch for the most part, spending most of their day on Twitter and Instagram and so on. <laughs> and James was surrounded and having a wonderful time. Do you find that that's the general rule? Or do you find that people kind of are scratching? It, it, is your magic a puzzle to them? Or is it truly this art of tomfoolery? I, is it really about a, or, or is it more of a, wow, you're, you're a tricky guy, James. That's cool how you well, hit that card. Well, I've worked stage. extremely hard, as Michael just explained, to try and soften that blow, to take the gotcha aspect out of it at all costs. Uh, and I think in most of my work, 
I've accomplished that and I still work on it and it's not always, but people fall on a spectrum and some people are just thrilled to see something new and interesting and exciting and those people are marvelous and some people must have an explanation right here, right now. If you're not going to give it to them, uh, perhaps they're going to go looking for it on their cell phone, on Google, which is actually very difficult to do if you don't actually know what the trick is called. Um, so, but they will try and do it. And I find that people are enormously receptive of magic. Now, there's a caveat to that. You have to put them in a situation where they're willing to receive that. I remember being booked to perform for patrons at a supermarket. And these are people who are taking time out of their day to do something like grocery shopping with a time constraint. They could not care less about the most beautiful piece of magic in the world. Um, and that was something I sort of had to discover is that context is key. So that you have to put people in the right frame of mind to see magic. You have to first talk to them a little bit, convince them that you're a nice person, someone they might like to have a conversation with. I mean, the worst thing you can say to a complete stranger is, yo, check this out. As like, whoa, what is going on here? Yeah, immediately so, get your hackles up. Exactly. So if you can avoid putting him into that defensive mode, then I think magic can be a wonderful experience. I mean, that's one of the reasons why, you know, there's dinner before the show. People get to sit and relax. They realize that nothing up here is going to explode or fall on top of them. No one's going to squirt them with a water pistol or something like that. Um, and that means that you can enjoy an experience. About 25 years ago, I did a lot of restaurant work. And I did a lot of magic at tables with kids. And every now and then I'd do a trick and I'd finish it. And one of the parents at the table would say to the kid, how did he do that, Jimmy? And before Jimmy could open his mouth, I'd say to the whoever asked that question, wait a minute, don't put him on the spot. You tell me how I did it. And the parent would go, I don't know how, I, how you did it. I go, then why are you asking him? When parents ask children to come up with explanations, because the parent says, if you don't figure out how this magician did that, then you are stupid. If a parent puts that pressure on a kid, that's a child that's going to grow up into somebody who hates magic. Because he was not allowed to experience the astonishment of it without demanding an answer. But Michael, isn't that, isn't that what a rationalist wants? So as a parent, as no, a no, philosopher, no, don't I want to teach my child to question? Yes, but, to uh, say, but hang on a minute there, Michael. You're not fooling me with your card tricks. No, isn't that I'm not. Want? I'm not selling you a religion or a vacuum cleaner or a set of encyclopedia or a thing that's going to make your penis bigger or anything else. I'm selling you a theatrical experience at your table. Did Hamlet really die, Mommy? No, he's an actor. He's not dead. Well, why is he laying there dead? It's a play. Well, that just ruined the whole thing, didn't it? This is a theatrical experience. If I am trying to make you believe I have powers to sell you something, yes, I and, say a thousand percent. And to some degree, that's still done today, right? I mean, we've got... We've oh, no, nobody got, does that anymore. You know, fortune no, tellers. No. I mean... But but let's go back let's go back five six hundred years or even longer and let's talk about mm -hmm. about miracles about about uh, shaman about uh, how far do you want to go back two thousand years yeah we can go even farther <laughs> but I'm going back to sort of the Enlightenment period you know Pascal Father Calculus uh, Descartes we've got some pretty important people writing and thinking and yet in the streets we've got magicians we've got people being burned at the stake we got Reginald Scott's the discovery of witchcraft. You know, maybe one of the most rational guys in the world writing for, you know, one of the first times in print about magic because we were, King James was killing too many witches, throwing too many people down the well, hanging too many people from the mm -hmm. highest tree. So really interesting tension going on there. But do you think regular the burning magicians of, The be burning of witches was certainly not based on rationality. That wasn't based on rational thinking, was it? Well, it would have been probably to King James, I, I would think. Well, well. It's an instinct yeah. that we have that is entirely natural, which is if I have an explanation which occurs to me, which makes sense to me, that explanation is probably correct. 
the idea is that our intuition has value when approaching new and unsolved problems. And the history of knowledge on this planet shows that exactly the opposite is true. Every single major discovery, whether it's the fact that the sun goes around the earth or that uh, there is an absolute here and now, relativity, discovery of atoms, quantum mechanics, every single uh, discovery of germs, every single major advancement in human knowledge, evolution, is almost as counterintuitive as it is possible to be. So if there's a takeaway from any of that, it's that when you approach a problem which is new for the first time, one thing you should remember above all else is that your intuition is probably the last place you want to go. Uh, Stephen Novella, who many of you probably know, had a, has an expression called, uh, I'm going to get this right, S neuropsychological humility, which is sort of a state of rational acceptance about the limits of your own power of reasoning. And basically watching a magic trick is a wonderful way to catapult you into that state. Uh, and that's what I think the real value of magic is. It sort of reawakens that notion to, to make you realize that, you know, your brain is not that good at this. And it's only by taking an extraordinary amount of time and care and patience that you can actually approach these things. And if you're going to jump to conclusions, you're most likely going to jump to the wrong conclusion. Do you think that when Scott wrote The Discovery of Witchcraft, do you think he had in mind that there was just too many religious expl explanations going on, too many supernatural notions, and these guys, bo bozos like King James, were burning people at the stake for no reason, no rational reason, and so do you think that these, really, these miracles, well, these mysteries were just, they were just magicians. These were folks that were, you know, tricksters, sleight of hand guys like you. Uh, but, 500 years ago, the, would you guys have been burned it, at the stake? It wasn't the sleight of hand people that were getting burned at the stake, I don't believe. It was the nice little old lady who had a big wart on her nose and who, you know, lived with her 25 cats and who her neighbor didn't like very well, who got, you know, turned in and burned the, I mean, speed ahead today, we've still got a lot of, a huge portion of the population still living with that kind of a worldview. Well, yeah. Yep. 500 sure, look at, years look at, later, right? From, from So one guy publishes a report that has been discredited by every major medical journal that vaccines cause autism. And yet this bozo has managed to bring back measles, and all these things that we have managed to eradicate. Why? Because people go, well, I don't understand about correlation and causation, but you know, my kid's autistic and I did vaccinate him. Well, is that the only thing you've looked at? Is there anything else? No, but it's the easy one. And this famous, beautiful person on TV tells me that's what it is, so I'm going to believe her. You know, the hardest... Yes, you want people to think. You want people to think rationally. I demand that you think rationally when I perform. I want you to look at every single thing I do critically and go, what did he do? Did he? No, he's fine. No, he didn't do that. No, he's fine. And I still get you at the end because I want you to experience that, oh, wow. Do you realize that today, here's the kind of crap you read on the internet. Do you know this is the longest... <laughs> This darkness we are experiencing, because this is the winter solstice. Today is the winter solstice. This is the longest period of darkness in the history of planet Earth. Tonight, did you know this? I read it on Facebook. Now. Ever. Exactly. And that sounds like it's important, doesn't it? It isn't. Every single subsequent year, the darkness that happens in the winter solstice is a little longer because the rotation of the Earth is slowing down. That's not an important event. It happens every year. But you read these things and you go, wow, that's unbelievable. I need to, I need to share that with my friends and not yep. check it out. You know. So, so I want to I I switch gears a little bit here. What do you think? Somebody so, got a couple questions sitting here. But this idea of uh, being a radical skeptic, being a skeptic, there's an irony here. There's a paradox here. You want me to believe in magic or at least the mystery? No, no, no. I don't want you to believe in anything. I have no desire to make you believe in magic. I don't want you to believe in anything. 
The last thing I want you to do is believe in anything. But you want me to experience something. I want you to experience. It's not based in a, in a, in a rational world. Exactly view. right. But I don't want but you to believe belief. in it. No, it isn't. Well, it's a belief for the moment. My wonder is only going to be tied. Maybe my worldview is a rationalist or maybe I'm a rational, uh, radical skeptic. But doesn't, the question is, doesn't that skepticism, doesn't that paradox get in the way of me actually experiencing magic in the way that you guys are talking about? No, no, nope. not at all. Not a bit. No. Not a bit. Why do I, I Why don't not? want you to believe? What do you? What do you? Anybody here believe anything about me? Okay, now we're getting other hands than the fact up in the that audience. I know how to do my job pretty well. Oh, this is That's what there I know go. how to do. What's my job? My job is to fool you. Did I fool you? Yes. Okay, I know how to do my job. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Shout at the question. I can repeat it. Sure. That sure. isn't what you said at the bar last night. <laughs> Meat and curry. Boy, that really Very got tasty. calmed yeah. down over there. You, yes. Oh, Mike, you're so special. We got a, we got a tonight, hand. you're meat and curry. We got, we, got we got a hand here, Michael. Broke What's, my what, go ahead. Okay, so I guess the, the photographer. Line, you draw like there and then say, you can kind of draw the line, I guess, how do you draw the, I guess you can put it for me. Like, Ooh, there's okay. one end, there's belief in something versus the other end of suspending its disbelief. You kind of say, yes, I know I'm being. Mm-hmm. You want to take it? So it's sort of well, repeat, repeat, James. It's, it's, the, the, suspension of the, it's the suspension of disbelief, which if you actually trace it back to its origin, was it Coleridge? Maybe. Maybe. It's purely in the context of something like a play or poetry. Or dating. <laughs> or dating. So... In magic, you know uh, the sack of meat guy, don't you? <laughs> don't, don't you go out with the audience is funnier One than night, you it's everything's great. Who is next this guy? Next Who is this guy over here? Sack of meat guy. <laughs> it's the damn so, sack of meat guy. There we go. <laughs> so, suspension of disbelief should not happen in magic. Your belief is not suspended. Your your belief, your your disbelief is being shattered with a sledgehammer. Whatever the fact is that you're watching, whether it's a bill and a melon or a card, which somehow wound up somewhere, that's being really rammed down your throat. There is no willing suspension of disbelief in magic on at your all. part. No. If you walk into a theater and there's minimal sets and you can see the lights and the actors are not really wearing you know, period costumes, and then you are willingly saying, I'm going to ignore all of this and merely focus on the emotion of the play Okay, hang on. I got to take issue with both of you and the room. So I show my six-year-old a coin trick. Okay, hang what? on, hang you on. A twenty-six-year-old. Older old. audience. Too. A twenty-six-year-old. Oh, a twenty-six. A twenty-six-year-old. Okay. And I take a coin and I do the most beautiful French drop or pass that you have ever seen, the two yep. of you, and I blow the audience away. It is palpable. You hear the the whoosh of the crowd. The wow, that was awesome. And I will argue that immediately, within seconds or less, the audience will go to, how the hell did he do that? I have a problem with that as a magician and as a philosopher because I want you as a 26-year-old skeptic to hold on to that moment just a little longer. Well, this well, gets, this gets because very... Because something I think... Oh, there, so you talked about the, intuition. I think, I think scientific discovery happens in those moments. I think those moments of wonder, part of the reason why as a magician I've been so frustrated for so many years is, is I do that. And, and I've got this, and, and I think 500 years ago, people would have, would have went home going, they would have made you chief, that was dude. unbelievable. Yep. Yeah, well, true, true. And there's a problem with that as well. But there's just but something about that that it, I lost as a kid, as a teenager, I don't it know. It is 13. only through. And, and I'm sad about that. It is only through the continued application of thought and reason that you can sustain that, oh my God, right? If I don't go through the checklist in my head of all of the ways that could have possibly happened, I'm not actually going to be impressed that it did happen. And you could take an extreme example. Let's say you place a coin in your hand, then this person goes to the washroom and then comes back, and then you open your hand and the coin is not there. There's going to be no astonishment there whatsoever, even though your technique may have been identical. So you have to be inviting them to question what they're seeing. 
Otherwise, there will be no astonishment to begin with. It's only, it's only through the questioning and comparing with what we know about reality. So it's only the fact that we have a lifetime of experiences that say coins placed in hands don't spontaneously vanish that there's anything there. And it's only because I can go to that and start asking, what, where, how, sleeves, other hand, did he swallow the thing, what? It's only through that process of questioning that there'll be any feeling of magic whatsoever. We got a long, we got a question, I think, over on this side of the room. I'm not sure. Maybe from this gentleman no, over no, here. No, Go no, ahead. We'll we'll repeat it. That was me. Uh, my question was quite simple. There's a common denominator in a lot of the subject matter you've been addressing. Number one, children. Number two, fooling the audience. And my question is: Is it less of a desire to be fooled and more about a preservation of play and through play maintaining innocence? Nice. So uh, the question is about play and about innocent, well, child childlike sort of play. Of course, is yeah. Even as we grow older, we, we become more experienced, perhaps jaded, bitter. Right, and like that's exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that cynic, the cynical of the real world, almost. Well, you know. And magic gives us the opportunity. That yeah, it's good. That so magic gives us that wonder, that childlike innocence. We, cynic. we have, for the most part, when we're kids. I mean, my daughter, we are. We are being very realistic about lots of things. We don't maintain fantasies about a lot of things. This is the last, uh, last year was the last year that Santa actually really had any meaning. But there is something that you don't want to take away from a kid to have that there's nothing under the tree and then there's all this stuff under the tree. That's a very magical moment for a kid. And, and even being as a skeptical a person as I am and as atheist a person as I am, I don't want to deprive my kid of having that moment. At a certain point, yes, it has to be transcended and there has to be this understanding that that kind of stuff. But it's best if she makes that discovery herself. Does it make sense to you that Santa somehow gets to every human being around the planet and if he did, why don't these people get anything? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You approach it that way. But getting back to your thing about why do people try to figure it out? If they didn't try to figure it out, we don't have magic. If I do what I do and people go, oh yes, obviously this man's able to you know, know ahead of time what, five card, what a card five people are gonna decide on. There's a, a friend of mine named Simon Aronson who's a magician in Chicago and he said it very clearly. He said there is a difference between an audience not knowing how an effect is done and their knowing that it can't be done. In one thing, all you are deprived of is the method. In the second one, you've worked through everything, every possible thing, and you go, there is no method. And that's a beautiful moment when Santa Claus leaves those presents under there and the Easter Bunny hides those eggs. Mm -hmm. And look, the one thing I miss most in life, I've been doing, I'm 62, I've been doing magic since I was six. So that's 56 years. I know a lot about magic. I know a lot about conjuring. I don't get fooled very often. And I miss that. So if a guy can just do a trick and I go, what the frack happened there? That's a gift to me. That is a profound gift. And the problem with magic is most magicians don't do what they do in the offering of this gift to the audience. But is it fair to say that that, that hunger of maturity to pursue understanding knowledge experience is equally paralleled by innocence and play? I think we all, I think so. I, I think the two run, I mean, if we didn't have this need to solve problems, then we wouldn't have cured all these diseases and have what we have. But yes, at our core, there is this need, I believe, to see something theatrically. And please understand, everything I say is in the term, in the realm of theatrical magic. I do not want you to believe I have powers. I do not want you to believe I can talk to your dead grandmother. I do not want you to believe I can do psychic surgery. Any of that bullshit. I do not want you to believe that. I want you to come away from this theatrical experience going, that was pretty damn wonderful. That was pretty damn wonderful. Well, there's wonderful. a risk there because we could be doing this 
in an auditorium at a university and you could seem an awful lot more serious and professorial and people might be inclined to take that uh, more at face value that this is, a, this is not a theatrical thing, that this is a real serious academic thing and this is a demonstration of those. How do you make sure that people can distinguish that? Well, I've seen my act and I, if anybody takes me seriously, they're just not So, so we gotta, we got to wrap it up in a couple of minutes. You guys have been really patient. I, I, it's awesome. Thank you so much. But So this is actually a bit of a troubling question, but how do you learn to take advantage of people's assumptions? I'm not really sure what the, uh, you know, the underlying uh, my, intention um, behind this question is. I'll tell you what is, I It's, it's, it's what I one. tell every aspiring magician. The first thing you need to do is smuggle things through customs. <laughs> you, need to, you need to mule yourself up with some eggs, in, like in James's case, or something that you can look right in somebody's eye and without breaking a sweat, just lie to their face. Well, and, I'll, I'll, if you want more uh, practical advice, whoever this is, I'm not, that, that might not wind practice. me up, you know, land me in jail. Yeah. yeah. Well, start digging around and looking for the secrets of magic. The, se the worst, the best kept secret in magic is that we are terrible at keeping secrets. <laughs> absolutely, well, not absolutely, but almost anything you could possibly want to know is available if you actually knew where to go looking for it. Oh, I don't. www.michaelclose.com, or you could find... No, I'm sorry. Was that, that was not what I was talking about. No, they're right. e-books. They're downloadable. You could be reading them on the way home on your iPad while driving. Uh, but the information is out there. And part of the reason that um, you can be fooled by such... Simple is not the right word, but maybe efficient or elegant is a better one. Part of the reason you can be fooled by such straightforward things is that magic has gone through a process of evolution by natural selection. It's true. The tricks that are simultaneously easy to execute and effective have survived from generation to generation and they have wound up in print. And the ones that didn't fool Helen Keller, you don't read about. No, you uh, saw them in my act. <laughs> Uh, really so we, that, a, that's how that's well, how it's developed. It's and marvelous so, irony, really. It's all out there for all the skeptics and the rationalists yeah, and those who it. want to know. It's all there. Well, but, but people it don't dig it up, right? It's, it's, it's we it, do want to be fooled. The I question think, right? is we do how it. how important is it to you to find it out? Yes, uh, I think most everything that I did you can read about. I've written mm -hmm. most of that stuff up. However, entertaining it would be for you to find that out. I never go into a performance. Maybe I did when I was a kid. I don't know. But now, I do not see a performance as me taking advantage of anybody. I, I am not here to make you feel stupid. That's not why I'm here. People hate... I'll back up. That's not right. Most, a lot of people don't like puzzles. You know, if you said, do you, you want to do a, here, do this little block puzzle where you've got to, I don't want to do that. That's too much like, they don't want to do that. But they would certainly like to be entertained and see something mysterious. If I am taking advantage of you, I am taking advantage of the fact that I understand psychologically how you're going to handle certain situations. I take advantage psychologically of what you're going to remember and what you're not going to remember. I take advantage psychologically of the fact that I will distort your memory of exactly what happened. I'm going to take advantage of the fact that when the amazing thing happens, it obliterates some of your short-term memory, which gives me a chance to lie through my teeth about what went on and fool you that way. Am I taking advantage of you? Well, this, this is, these are the tools of my trade. I'm mm -hmm. not stealing your money. I'm not coming up to you and conning you out of your life savings. But I am using the things that you don't even know about yourself, things you wouldn't even consider how you see the world. Even a smart group of skeptical people like yourselves, you have no frickin' clue what you bring to the, the performance that I use against you. And I'm not the only one that many other magicians use against you. Talking about vanishing a coin and why you can't fool your six-year-old? Yes, 26-year-old. Juan, Juan Tomber is, doesn't make any difference. One, here's the problem with vanishing a coin. People aren't stupid. If I show a coin here and I put it here and it's gone, no matter how beautifully I do it, 
There's only one other place it probably could be because that's the last place you saw it. Oh, oh I'm sorry, dude. Oh. <laughs> that was the same minute. guy, by the way, for our uh, and there's radio no, there's audience. No, there's no and Santa the bubble Claus. has been burst forever. There's no forever. Santa Claus either. And so, so we got to we got to wrap it up. Sorry, oh, I'm sorry. I got we, so much more to say. I know you did. Um, Except I so have to let's really wrap it up. Buy him a drink. Personal. You can hear more. Something personal. Tell me what you've learned about others being a magician. Really quick. It's got to be quick because this is radio. And um, tell me favorite part about your work. Two two personal things, real quick. Then we'll wrap it up. We'll have a big round of applause for everyone in the room and go home feeling that much better about ourselves. Me first. Um, I I love doing. Uh, this and I find it incredibly rewarding. I mean, I, I I finally figured out part of it is that it shoves in your face and sometimes down your throat just how much of the world around you you take for granted. You do not know how the red deck and the blue deck worked. You do not know how the melon worked. You also don't know how your cell phone and your microwave oven work but you only care about some of those things and not the others. It's because you see your microwave oven every day that it just kind of is part of your life. Um, and also I think people, you, you sort of have a sense of where you would go to find out how a microwave oven worked. What bothers you about magic, uh, if it bothers you at all or maybe it excites you at the same time, is that it is something you don't understand on a list of a million things you don't understand. But somehow for that split second, um, a lying, cheating bastard really, really, really made you care. Which is what if, fun. What, if, what have you learned about people being, uh, doing that, fooling people, deceiving people? That deep down inside, we are all the same. We have the same brain inside of our heads. Not that guy. Not, well, most of us. Um, and and if, if I can figure something out and you can't, that it has almost nothing at all to do with whether or not one of us is smarter than the other, it has more to do with the fact that one of us has access to different information. Michael, what about you? Tell us about your, your love for the craft, what it, you know, not what it means to you maybe, but something well, it, about it. Well, it, it is very, it is very, it, you know, this changes with well, this changes people. with age. When when kids get into magic, for the most part, the guys who get six, in, six and, year olds. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's, it's as a six year old. Uh, you know, it's fat little boys with no social skills, who are looking for something, something to say. Look at me. Look at me. And that's a big problem with magic because so much of magic is look at me. Look what I can do. I can do this thing. Look at me. Look at me. And then over time that shifts and you become comfortable enough with who you are that if you continue to perform, I try to make it not look at me, it's look at this and look at us. So much of the magic I do tends to put the hero role to somebody else, not myself. Not, I don't, I, to be honest, I don't need you to tell me how good I am. That isn't why I do magic. That isn't what I'm in it for. I would rather have this experience that can be only accomplished with a group of people. And it doesn't even happen here. It doesn't happen here. It all happens in your head. I know how it works. There isn't a single moment of magic in my entire act. There isn't anything astonishing to me. But what is wonderful for me is watching you and you receiving this gift, this incredible gift of an astonishing moment that you can just be happy with without having to. I used to say, look, my job is this. For a moment, I'm going to make you forget all the big problems in your life, and I'm going to replace them with little, tiny, annoying, insignificant problems. <laughs> Most of which you will put aside but like a pebble in your shoe, every now and then this little thing in your brain will roll and you'll step on it and you go, how the hell did he do that thing with the box where the contract ended up inside? Damn it. And what then it'll roll away and it'll be gone. What, what have you learned about people? What have I learned about people? Deceiving people all these years. Well. 56 long years. 
the, the main thing I, I've discovered is that you have to deceive without animosity. You have to deceive without making it seem like that's making me happy that you're fooled. And, and really, I've, I've spent... A, it sounds to me like it's about the other. It's, of it's course, about, about the other. There is no magic for me. I don't experience a single magical moment except through you. Yes. I hope so. I hope um, so. I don't know. It's just, it's just all, it's awesome. I think she wants to say it's awesome. Everything is awesome. It's awesome. For me, like, there's some of the tricks I do know. I'm not going to tell anyone anything. Well, the Jameses, you don't know how the hell I'm doing anything. I just. Well, and I think what's really yeah, neat. Yeah, yeah, no, go ahead. What what I think is really cool, and we've got to wrap it up, is that I think it's proof proof that the magic has been about others tonight, and for a social change guy who's trying to change the world on some level, that's pretty awesome and pretty amazing. Thank you all for coming, Dr. James Allen. Michael Close, please have a nice hand.